but I'm glad you admit that there was a jinx because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anymore. You you're, you're, nice? like, you're clearly I've seen, I've admitting seen that it was. I've an seen issue. glimpses of you having a big heart as an older man. Just, just show me your heart a little bit right now. No, just I, I look. I hated the jinx because I wanted to see you get quality guests, and and I was getting texts and phone calls from folks saying, "I don't oh, want to do it. Got don't want to do week. it." I'm like, "No, what I'm a saying, slam dunk." You, you, you can believe that? All right, Georgetown uh, beat Denver in overtime. It was a great scene uh, watching the game on Fox Sports 2. No fans allowed, but on the opposite side of the fence, there's all these students. They're in a big pack. They got no shirts. They got their faces painted, and the Hoyas won in overtime. Watching that game the whole time, I think it was clear. Georgetown looked like a playoff team, and the win now takes any kind of subjectivity out of it. So they, they will be in the NCAA tournament, and deservingly so. I think they're a dangerous team this year, and down the road, I think they're going to be really, really good. Georgetown's a team that with the transfer portal, the grad programs that they have, location, coaching staff, Kevin Warren's got an infectious personality. He can recruit. Uh, to me, that is a sleeping giant. And I go back to what we said maybe a few weeks ago. Georgetown, oh, about 20 years or so, looked like it was on the verge of taking that leap to, at the time, joining Princeton, Virginia, Syracuse, Hopkins to move into that tier. And it went the other way. Um, I, I think there's an opportunity now for Georgetown to move into tier one in the coming years. TD Erland struggled. Um, I, I know, Quint, you've made a big deal about that. Kark, you've made a big deal about that. Like, can we give the guy a pass? Like one bad game, two bad games in five years? I mean, if I still had a face off to win, like he's still the guy. I mean, is that that big of a deal that TD well, Erland went four out of 12? Yes, it is a big deal. And He's comparing that outing against his track record. So it is a big deal. I mean, he's, he's one of those guys that's been so good. And when you're facing off at 75, 80%, you've competed at that level. And you have a standard that everyone just assumes. And he has his own standard as well. I think it is an issue because two of his worst four games in his three and a half, four year career happened to be with the new rules. Um, and, and, and one he, of those was eight out of 14, like eight out of 14 okay, that's is still not, that's better not good than 50%. For TD. That's, that's not, not good for TD. If you asked him, he would not be 50. happy with that. If you asked him, okay. he would say no way. That's not But good. it's still better than 50%. That's my point. Okay, but he's not a 50% face-off guy. He's one of the best, if not the best statistically ever in the NCAA. So to me, I just, I just have a question, like the lack of preseason, the lack of fall ball, him coming in with the new rules – is he adjusting? I mean, he's been a type of guy that's made adjustments in his past, but you know, he's, he's facing off with, with a different type of, of technique and the mechanics aren't the same for the prior three and a half years with the standing neutral grip. Q, you know what this feels like? This feels like when people debate LeBron James has one bad playoff game, you know, where he's nine for 27 and, oh yeah, here's LeBron in the playoffs. He can't do this. Like, Sample size. We're talking a two-game sample Dude, size in a five-year career. No, but no, what but if they changed the rules of basketball and then LeBron was struggling? Yeah, they, like they, they changed the, the rule. The for rule his, also his his, the rule his discipline has been completely changed rule-wise. Didn't he go fourteen for fourteen in his first game? First with the two games, rules? he won every faceoff except one. It was like twenty-four out of twenty-five. Okay, and in the last two games, I mean, this game is four of twelve. And, and to his credit, like that's the worst game of his career. So I, I, I do think he'll adjust. I like what I saw from Georgetown. Dylan Watson now on the left side. Kark, you've always loved Jake Caraway on the right. Their young middies are more athletic than they have been in the past. Remember, this is a Georgetown team we covered in the playoffs a couple of years ago. They were so reliant on like Vaccaro and Wittenberg. Their other parts are really good now. So they're, they're going to be dangerous. A uh, great Thursday night game again. It's, uh, this uncanny, Anish. Like you hope for the, that, that the role continues. And then, and then there we are in overtime. It's uh, that, that game had a lot of tension and drama uh, as Duke took down Virginia at Clark, uh, The Q Thursday night is becoming special in, in the world of lacrosse. ACC Thursday night. Um, I really do feel we're, we're growing the audience. We're bringing in new fans. You sent me a clip, Packer and Durham, which is the flagship morning radio show that simulcast on TV on ACC Network. They were talking with John Desco about ACC Thursday night. And, and Packer, a you know, big sports fan, he's kind of dipping his toe into lacrosse. And all of a sudden, like, we're engaging these people who are on the, you know, in the sports world, on the periphery of lacrosse, 
who now want to wade into these waters. I think it's great. Can we talk about Syracuse? I got to ask you guys. I'm going to answer yeah. this question, and I want to hear it from you. Is Syracuse dead? And I'm going to say no, based on past history. I go back to 2004 when no one gave them a shot to win the national championship, and they beat Johns Hopkins in the semifinals, who was heavily favored, and Navy in the championship. 2011, the Virginia Cavaliers, they were an afterthought coming into the playoffs. In April, everyone was like, these guys are done. 2016, North Carolina, they squeak into the playoffs. They have a one-goal game against Marquette in round one. They win the national title. 2019, the Virginia Cavaliers, they had a lot of issues in April. No one thought they were a national title contender, but all these teams made big-time adjustments. Like, for example, 2004 Syracuse, they decided to go into a zone against Johns Hopkins, and Hopkins had more than enough issues to deal with that day, and Syracuse dominated. Syracuse defensively has massive holes. They cannot win against top competition the way they're playing right now. There's, there's a face-off discrepancy, but they can't buckle down. They're not like Notre Dame that can lose 73% of their face-offs and buckle down and cause turnovers and make stops. So if it was me, I would throw the zone in there. I think it's desperate measure time for Syracuse. I thought Duke took a step forward defensively uh, in their in their win over Virginia, uh, and they continue to kind of answer the bell in, in these close games. Joe Robertson, most underrated player in the country. Is that fair to say? And yeah. Stephen Rafus, they're Not all part fair. of that uh, all Dangerfield team that Clark likes. Yeah, Rodney Dangerfield. I mean, the problem is I want to have a, an all Dangerfield team, but a lot of the people that watch, especially the millennials and, and the new generation, they don't even know who Rodney is. Rodney is an absolute legend call me when you have no class yeah i'll tell you what then why don't you call me sometime when you have no class Can't get show no me some respect. respect when i started coaching high school in the early 90s mcdonough school the eagles had this tall lanky crease man that would pickpocket our goalie on all outlets and deposit the ball in the net, kind of turn to our sideline and give him that smile. And then he went on to Hopkins and did the same thing for four years. Coached there, what is it, 18 years, I believe, on the Blue Jay sidelines? I think I coached for 14 and played for four, so I'm 18 total. 18 years. Uh, and then recently switching over. John Tillman gives you a call and you're the OC as we welcome in Bob Benson, offensive coordinator for Maryland. Bob, I got to tell you, I'm looking at these numbers. Like, you guys are shooting the, the highest number that I've, I've ever seen. What, what, what is going on with the shooting percentage? Yeah, don't jinx us. Um, our guys have been that doing that would be Kark. Don't let your no, shooters no, on. No, Bobby, on. you told me on the phone last night it's all your coaching. <laughs> I wish. I wish. I got here a couple months ago, so I'm just trying not to screw anything up. We can see you've done uh, great work with your office. Yes, exactly. I got a picture of the kids up there. You can see I got a couple of the trophies. Um, so I got to get some pictures at some point. But uh, no, the guys have done a great job. I think they share the ball um, and they go so hard and, and we stay kind of aggressive throughout the transition uh, period that I think we're getting pretty good opportunities. Um, and we're not taking a lot of bad shots. And uh, the guys work hard on their shooting. They're always out before and after practice and uh, kind of perfecting their game. And I've been really impressed with that. And I wish I could take some credit for it. But uh, that's all of them. And uh, hopefully that keeps going. What's the di biggest difference between the Johns Hopkins and the Maryland lacrosse cultures? Just the feel in the building. Oh, God. I, I, I think there's a lot of similarities because uh, – you know, the, the work ethic um, of the players is something that at both places really impressed me. The extra shooting, the extra time, the extra film, um, their love for lacrosse. I, I think that, you know, those things are very, uh, you know, universal across both programs. Um, so, you know, I, I see a lot of similarities that way, um, without a doubt. Um, you know, I, I don't know if culturally there's a, a ton of differences. Um, you know, I mean, Coach Petromala, Coach Tillman, both extremely successful, extremely competitive. Um, you know, Coach Petro is probably a little more fiery um, that sometimes plays off in, into some things. And Coach Tillman, 
uh, you know, very analytical, um, do, does a great job with that. And, you know, that may play off as well. Um, but, you know, the, the kids are super competitive at both places. Um, and, you know, I, that part, the culture part has been a pretty easy transition because it's so similar. All right. I want to go into your personal life a little bit. Unique situation for you. You're doing a long distance marriage as we speak. Can you give us an idea of what it's like right now, balancing your personal and your professional life? That actually sounds good. Don't, yeah, don't put that in the, uh, don't put that on the, uh, final oh, that's definitely here. going on. That's definitely yeah. going on. God oh, bless my man. wife. I couldn't figure out when coach Tillman called, my wife was like, you have to go, you have to take this, just go. <laughs> um, but <laughs> what did that no, tell it's, you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's unique. We, we, we moved down there as soon as the kind of things happened at Hopkins, we moved down there for her job and she is a rock star. Um, and she does a great job professionally. She does a great job with the family. She's awesome. And, uh, you know, we thought we'd be down there for a few years, see how things shake out post COVID um, with the coaching situation. Um, and we love it down there. My, my kids love it down there. They're involved in baseball, lacrosse, everything, you name it. Um, basketball, they, uh, they got some best friends down there already. But uh, when Coach Tillman called, there wasn't a lot of places that I was gonna come back to coaching for. Um, but this was an opportunity that was hard to pass up. And she's, uh, she said, you go and I'll take care of everything. And I jumped on a plane pretty much the next day. Um, and she has been awesome. She's allowed me to do this. And I fly back and forth on Sundays to go see uh, her and the kids. Um, they're hoping to come up this weekend. They've came up to a couple games. Um, so they try to come up when they can. Um, it's been, there's no normalcy. Um, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants, um, but in a way, flying by the seat of our pants is actually more normal for us than maybe normalcy. Hey, when I listen to your calls sometimes, when I've been on the field, your EMO calls are, I wouldn't say strange, but some of the names are different. Can you elaborate a little bit on those? Uh, naming plays is the hardest thing ever. And I, I try to let the kids name them. We've got some uh, out there ones right now, for sure. Um, when you're letting Bubba Fairman name your plays, you never really know what you're getting. Um, but, uh, you know, we had, some, we had some good times. Even uh, when, I, when I was at Hopkins, we had uh, one year, I think we named them all after Bachelor characters. So we had like <laughs> Cora and Trista. Um, another year we had it named after the Jersey Shore. So we would all watch the Jersey Shore on Thursday night and try to come up with some <laughs> play names. So we had like GTL and Seaside and Karma. Um, we, uh, yeah, the, the naming of plays can get unique and, uh, you know, we do whatever we can to keep them fresh and to try to remember them. Um, you know, remembering the plays is not always the easiest with the names when you start getting to the end of the year and you've got so many. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, we try to be as creative and fun as we can in that matter. You know, you've been in the coaching industry for a while right now. If you were to go to Vegas with, I don't know, a couple or maybe three other coaches, who would you go with and why? Vegas, I'm talking like getting rowdy in Vegas. All right. If I'm going to Vegas, um, I'm definitely taking Kevin Warren and I, don't I think you just can watch him on the sidelines for a good couple minutes and uh, and know why you're taking him, um, you know. And the other ones, uh, I'm a relationships guy. I'm, you know, and obviously Kevin's a good friend of mine. He was in my wedding, so uh, you know. And I think the other ones are going to be Stephen Boyle, John Crawley, Matt Rakowski, Kevin Conway, the guys that I played with, and uh, yeah. you know, and the guys that I know the best. Um, you know, because they'd be a ton of fun um, as well. And, the guys uh, you trust not to post pictures on the internet. Yeah, you got to be careful who you go to Vegas with. It's time for something of the week brought to you by Lax.com. Are your shoulder pads and goalie chest pads ready for the new safety standards? Lax.com has the largest selection of pads that meet the new Noxie ND200 standard and are SEI certified. To see all the new shoulder pads, visit lax.com slash shoulder pads. Something of the week, Quint, let's start with you. Well, you know, there's rivalries that transcend the sport of lacrosse. Uh, when two teams meet, the opportunity to bring in new fans, to show young fans the importance of this game. And for me, that's Army-Navy this week. 
Remember these two teams didn't play a year ago. I grew up on this rivalry. My brother was a midfielder for Navy. And I remember going up to two games at Mikey stadium that completely transformed my mind as to what, what college lacrosse looks like. I remember after those games living in my backyard, throwing the ball. I mean, the, the dream was sparked by this rivalry and Army and Navy, both relevant. Army's a top 10 team. Navy's a top 20 team. The student athletes, their leadership, what they stand for. Uh, th this game, in my eyes, should be the most celebrated game of the week. My something of the week is Duke defenseman Kenny Brower. Now, everybody thinks it's going to be the play where Connor Schellenberger left them. And I, I know on air, I said ankles sold separately in the heat of the moment. People ran with that. <laughs> sold separately and but I want to make it clear Kenny Brower played an unbelievable game and I, I kind of feel bad because everybody looks at that one clip and they turn that into a microcosm of the game and, and, and the player and it's not fair you and I did the entire game cue I thought Brower was magnificent save for that one play he won his one-on-one -on -one matchup with Schellenberger Duke's defense was a big reason they won that game. They held Virginia to, what, one goal in the last 13, 14 minutes? Kenny Brower is becoming an elite defenseman in college lacrosse. He won his matchup on Thursday night. He was a huge reason that Duke won the game. He's my something of the week. Don't let that one play define you. He certainly didn't. The way he bounced back from that, awfully impressive. Well said, Anish. And Kenny Brower oftentimes is getting the number one matchup when Duke plays. My something of the week is in Quint's backyard in Baltimore, Maryland, when Loyola High School played McDonough on Friday in a varsity lacrosse game. Freshman defender for the Loyola Dons, Peter Lake, was struck with a lacrosse ball in his chest area and had to be revived on the field. His life was saved. It was a beyond scary moment for everyone in attendance, for the teams, the players, but thankfully, the right medical staff was there, and there was also an AED machine that saved Peter's life. And I want to thank all the people there that were helpful in saving Peter's life, but also the past experiences at places like UMass and Cornell and Northport High School on Long Island, where players were struck with balls and tragically lost their lives the importance for an AED machine and the awareness around that machine and how it could save lacrosse players' lives was taken to another level. And that awareness saved Peter's life. And lacrosse is in a better spot now, safety-wise. And with all of the manufacturers making shoulder pads and chest protectors, that will help um, players in the future in terms of these, these moments that are so, so scary, and that really puts you in a situation um, to worry about safety for players. Um, but thanks again for everyone who was in attendance there. And Peter's back at his high school. He's out of the hospital. He's met with his teammates in the Loyola community, and we're so grateful for that. got a new background this week wow. matt oh. hamilton oh look at that look, look guys i just thought i'd bring more ceiling fans to the show i didn't feel wow. like it up, so i was like let's add some more right like what do we got here we got some rich mahogany and what else <laughs> it's uh rich mahogany uh the white fans the less brown fans i don't know what i, I, I don't i think we're pushing for a fan sponsor all right <laughs> hamilton what do we got what do we got this week Welcome to Mailbag. Guys, send your questions into yard sale at mail, uh, yard sale at uscross.org. Hey, hold, uh, on, hold on one second. Can you guys hold on? Stop. Sorry, I, I, I got a hold on, kid problem here. Hold on. Kid problem. Kid problem. On to Mailbag. Uh, oh, let's, let's take Park with the first question of Mailbag. This one comes from a Lackstad. 
Miles Gibbons, he says, as a father of an eighth grade, soon to be high school lacrosse player, I'm always impressed that you guys seem to know more than your typical football, basketball, baseball broadcasters about the up and coming players in the sport of lacrosse. How much high school or club lacrosse do you actually get to watch? I watch quite a bit. I was at a game this past weekend. I'll hit probably two or three more this week. I live in Connecticut on the Westchester County border. So I'll hit my local high school team, Ridgefield High School, where a good friend of mine, Roy Colsey coaches. He was a Yorktown high school teammate and Syracuse teammate and his boys play. So I'll catch them playing a bunch and uh, go back to Yorktown and catch some of the uh, the New England prep school league teams too, because they have some, some top talent uh, out there. And then in the state playoffs, hopefully catch them. So I, I watch a decent amount. And there's also streaming capabilities, which, you know, in the last few years have, have become quite good in terms of quality. Awesome. Moving to the next one. Before I give this one to Anish, I have to say, sorting through your mailbag questions this week, guys, 90% of it was, is Cuse going to make the tournament? Is Cuse dead? Seems to be a trend there. But one I was able to take ACC related was from at Brennan underscore McDermott 11. And we've kind of talked about this, but we're going to have it definitively. And I'll send this to you, Niche. Who is the best team in the ACC? I'm going to go Quint on this guy. Like, really? We're still doing this? I mean, I think for now we can eliminate Syracuse. And then out of the other four. So they're dead? They're dead for good? No, they're not dead for good. But right now they're clearly number five out of five in the ACC. I mean, that's, that's easy for anybody to see. Carolina, Duke, Notre Dame, Virginia, you know, pick your flavor of the day. You go with any of them. I'm not going to fight you on it. Um, what people are saying about Syracuse, though, I'll say this. If they lose the next two, they're five and six. I would imagine they would schedule another game. That Virginia win should still hold up. And when you look at the rest of the at-large field, that Virginia win right now is better than anything that Georgetown or Denver has. Um, that should be enough with the strength of schedule. They don't have a bad loss. I still think if they get an extra game and they win that and they're 6-6, six and six, they get in. And honestly, if they win one of the last two, they're probably a top-eight seed. I mean, so is the sky falling? Yes, um, but – are, are we kind of in like an end game scenario right now? Uh, I, I still think there is um, a little bit of hope there. Um, I think maybe the ceiling on this team um, is not what it was at the start of the season. I think that's a fair point. All right. So there's some hope for Syracuse fans. Guys, keep sending in your questions about Syracuse. We might answer some. Moving to the next one, our favorite part of this portion. Quint has a question from Abby from Chicago talking about things behind them in the background. Um, what's hanging in Quint's kitchen backdrop? Ooh. Ooh. Uh, one of my hobbies is gardening. And so those are uh, things that I, that I grow in, in, in my backyard. We've been here about nine, 10 years and live. A, there's a golf course about a quarter mile away and the deer live on the golf course and walk here. And so you find each year what the deer and the rabbits eat. But one thing they don't eat are herbs. Uh, my basil, my mint, the rosemary, it's great for cooking cark. You'd love it. I dry the rosemary and you sprinkle it on steaks. Goes great on uh, homemade fries as well. Yeah. Uh, and the last would be sage. Sage is uh, kind of effervescent. I like to use it for like potpourri type things. Uh, you know, wipe, wipe your hands with the sage and it smells good. So this my guy's herbs, a renaissance man. He's a total well, renaissance herbs man. In my garden. Uh, hey, uh, I got something you done for exceptionally you. well. I got something for you, rosemary wise. Chop up some potatoes. Yeah. Uh, some Brussels sprouts, yeah. some carrots, olive oil in a nice, uh, you know, baking Pan. sheet, salt, pepper, spray the rosemary around there. And you have, you know, the, the roasted vegetable medley. It's delicious. Called garnishing when you, when you spray it on there. Garnishing. A little, little garnishing. this, little of that. Little you know, this, though, little of that. you know what I found when you garnish, you know what that means? That means you care, right? Like there's a difference between throwing something together and making it. And when you make something and you garnish, that means you care. When you just throw it together, ah, whatever. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is what you're having. But when you make something, you garnish, you put a little spice. Dude, you know what that's called growing up in my house? Mom cooked or dad cooked. <laughs> dad cooked, it was garnishing. My mom, uh, I miss her dearly, man. She, she passed. You know, seven years ago this this month, she was the worst cook, the worst cook ever. And she didn't garnish. She couldn't care less. It was like when, when we ate, when mom cooked, you felt like you were in prison. When dad cooked, you, you felt like you were a big shot living in Quint's kitchen. Mom threw it together. Dad made it. Yeah. 
All right, that's been Mailbag, sponsored by uh, Hamilton. Fans. Let's go. Fans. Hamilton Beach is a fan company. Yeah, my last name's oh. Hamilton, Hamilton Beach. Oh. Guys, like, let's tag them. Oh, seamless tie-in. Let's, let's get it. Yeah. Tag them. Tag them. Yeah. Tag them. So that's your mailbag. Yard sale at uscross.org, guys. Keep sending your questions. It's been great. Hey, Hamilton, uh, I got a question for you. Are we on next week, or did you cancel the show? Be honest with me. I've heard some rumblings. I, I didn't cancel the show, but we are going to take a two-week break. We're going to reset because May Madness is almost upon us, and we want to take a break, get everything in line, and hit you guys with some great stuff in May. So we're taking a two-week break. We're gonna, we might have some surprises in those two weeks, but we're going to come back May 11th, mark your calendars. We're going strong through Memorial Day. Okay, cut to the chase. Is it a reset or reassess? <laughs> There'll be a new crew. <laughs> We're gonna bring they like, wait, wait, they like the idea. They like the idea of yard sale, but just gotta, you know, tweak the personnel a little bit. We have to recast the primary <laughs> characters. We gotta change the name, develop a new look. We'll bring different guys in. Chris Cotter's gonna show up and it'll be Three great. Man yeah. Three man weave. Three man weave. Coming May 11th. Three man weave with Mark Dixon. Uh, <laughs> hey, before we wrap up on a uh, personal note, um, going to be missing a, a big lacrosse fan in our household and that's uh our dog lola um we're getting ready to say goodbye after 13 and a half years she has uh, devoured kark at the face-off facts would have been so mean uh, on ground balls off the wings and uh we take her to the dog park and and we throw the lacrosse ball around or put a tennis ball in the stick and throw it around and she loved it and she'd see the stick and she'd perk up and uh this past sunday you know kind of as a uh, an appreciation day for her. We took her out to the park uh, one more time. She can't really move around much. Her, her legs don't work. And, you know, we kind of put her on the dog bed and uh, my wife and I said, Hey, should we take the sticks? And we're like, I don't know. Like, you know, she doesn't really play much anymore. And so we decided to, to take the sticks and I take my daughter out about, I don't know, 20 yards uh, from the dog. My back is turned to the dog and we had the stick and we're just kind of shoveling the ball a little bit. And, she gets up off her bed or on, on her own, which is really hard to do. And um, for, for a little flash, she, she kind of hobbles over and she limps over and it was, hey, I kind of want to play. And she's, you know, reaching into the stick one more time. And so uh, we're going to miss her, um, friend of the game. Um, and I know all you guys met her, friend of you guys too as well. So um, she gave us 13 and a half un unbelievable years and uh, was a great family dog.